welcome to the defense of two Lyaska Lines doctoral dissertation. The title of the dissertation is Music Students' Experiences of Workload, Stress, and Coping in Higher Education. We are honored to have Dr. Vidal Lafort from the Guildhall School of Music and Drama in the United Kingdom as the opponent of this dissertation. As the chair appointed by the academic board at the Sibelius Academy, I hereby declare the public defense of Tula Askelainen's doctoral dissertation open. Honored Custos, honored opponent, honored audience. We all know that higher education is associated with a demanding workload and high levels of stress. However, we don't know what to do about that issue. One music student who participated in my doctoral research thought that it's difficult to change the situation because in general, in society, as well as in my department, people tend to idealize those multitasking individuals. Some of you are studying in higher education at the moment and understand this issue from your current studies. Some of you are parents of higher education students and you have seen how their stress accumulates every now and then to extremely high levels. All of you have heard concerns about students' extremely heavy workload and stress from the news. In these times, figuring out how to support higher education students' well-being is a burning question in our society. Although it has been a concern for decades, it became a serious issue after the COVID-19 pandemic started. This is not any difference uh, for students who specialize in music. In my doctoral research project, I have listened to many music students talking about the challenges that workload and stress have placed on their lives. Let us take a closer look at what it means to study music. As you know, music students usually start studying music during their childhood. Thus, they have already spent much more time with the chosen field than students who choose their subject when they enter university. It's not only technical skills that music students learn when uh, they practice their instrument or sing. They also create a deep emotional engagement with music itself. This is because uh, studying the arts often connects, deep, connects deeply with students' expre expressions, emotions, and experiences. In this way, music intertwines with the students' own personalities. As one of my research participants observed, music students have gotten used to constantly working since childhood and to expecting a lot of themselves. The typical higher music education learning environment partly derives from the traditional master apprentice model. A good example of this is uh, the one-to-one -one tuition model. Music students spend a great part of their studies in these individual learning situations where the relationship between teacher and student often becomes very special. If you recall your own memories from school, when you had to sing alone in front of the class, it's easier for you to imagine how performing music students feel when they are constantly in front of other people when they perform and rehearse. The people who see and hear their performances include not only their peer students and teachers, 
but also the wider public. Moreover, competition are also a traditional part of studying music professionally. Added to that, if you think about music students' calendars, their commitments to ensembles and other groups pose additional time and constraints. In addition to all this, there are often extra concerns and workload for music students related to the musculoskeletal issues and injuries that sometimes arise from long hours playing the instrument or singing. In my doctoral dissertation, I take a deep look into music students' specific experiences of workload and stress and how they cope with these experiences in higher education. When I received the wonderful opportunity to start my doctoral studies, I was working in student services in music faculties. In my administrative work, I saw how many students had difficulties in coping with their studies, and many questions arose. Why do higher education studies seem to negatively affect students' well-being? How could we change the situation so that students could better concentrate on learning and, most importantly, actually enjoy their years in higher education? Thus, my doctoral journey began with the happy synergy of my professional and academic worlds. When I started searching for literature related to my research topic, I was glad to see that the topics of music students' health and well-being had been widely researched. This research had also been utilized to support music students' study practices in many institutions, like here in the Sibelius Academy. However, it was surprising that studies focusing on music students' experience workload in higher music education settings were lacking. There was lots of research evidence available on student workload in general fields in higher education. It was rather concerning to read that unmanageable workloads may lead to students' decreased engagement and motivation and even burnout. Thus, I became determined to produce knowledge of music students' experiences so that I could contribute to developing both my own and others' work in a higher education. Specifically, the first aim in my research was to investigate how the music students themselves experience their overall workload. The second aim was to contribute to pedagogical practices and educational policies by providing recommendations for higher music education institutions to better support music students coping with their workload and stress. In my dissertation, I, together with my research team, approach these aims through four articles. In the first article, we conducted a systematic literature review on the topic of the workload of higher education students in music and other disciplines. The other three articles utilized a multi-strategy approach that integrated a quantitative and qualitative research. A total of 155 music students in five higher music education institutions in Finland and the United Kingdom responded to the workload stress and coping questionnaire. In addition, 29 of the questionnaire respondents participated in interviews. What did the first article teach us about the previous international research on music students' experience workload? It is interesting that the subject of workload is often associated with the strictly negative connotations of overload. However, it should be defined more widely because previous research has shown that workload can also be a positive aspect of studies for music students. 
This fact was confirmed in the latest stage of my research process. And it's perfectly described by one of my research participants in these words. I feel success when I have enjoyed doing or completing something. For example, exam concerts and other concerts in which I can play on my own or together with someone. And when, in that moment, I feel deep love and joy for playing, for other performers and for the audience. The findings of 29 studies from the Systematic Literature Review were synthesized into a total of 23 recommendations for good practices to increase music students' ability to cope with their workload provide tools for teachers to support music students' ability to manage and cope with workload and develop learner-centered environments in higher music education. Indeed, many of those 23 recommendations are already familiar to most administrators and teachers. For example, one recommendation suggests utilizing knowledge of music students' experiences and workload when developing curricula. One could expect that previous research has revealed some tricks that might solve student workload issues, but that kind of trick does not exist. The real trick is to ask higher music education institutions if you already know and use all of those recommended ways of supporting music students why do music students still experience heavy workloads, stress, and even burnout? I, along with the research participants, argue that music students' experiences have not been listened to carefully enough in most institutions. After the systematic literature review, I was curious to see what the collective data showed about research participants' experiences. Of the total of 155 research participants, 108 music students were from Finland and 47 were from the United Kingdom. There are differences in higher education systems between the two countries that affects, affects students' lives. For example, in contrast to the United Kingdom, uh, higher education institutions in Finland have low tuition fees. The results indicated that the university culture with high tuition fees is likely to increase music students' experience stress, but might not directly impact their experience study workload. Music students have their own ways of coping with workload and stress when they need support for music-specific physical and psychological problems. The research participants wanted their teachers to be aware of these pressures and show empathy for those students who have commitments other than studying. For example, part-time work uh, and family responsibilities can make time management challenging and cause additional stress for students. Indeed, almost 70% of the questionnaire respondents uh, had work uh, be be beside their uh, study, and almost 60% had work in the field of music. A very interesting result was that work relating to music did not have any influence on music students' experience stress. In fact, such work may even be seen as beneficial and invaluable for the music students' future careers. As this research participant noted, for me, it is the financial need in particular that forces me to work alongside studying. But the workload is also partly caused by me enjoying being able to work in my own field. I think that the same reasoning applies to many other students. Although they know that work during weekends and holidays causes extra commitments in the calendar, 
working is very beneficial for my current studies and for my future career. Next, I was interested in exploring to what extent experience, study workload, stress and proactive coping were associated with gender, level of degree, genre group and study program among the research participants. Some groups of music students ex experienced particularly significant workload and stress. For example, female students experienced more study workload and stress than male students. However, male students used proactive measures to overcome challenges and positive imagery to achieve their goals more often than female students. This helped male students to better cope with their study workload. An alarming conclusion of the study was that non-binary gender students used emotional support seeking statistically significantly less than female and male students. Although the non-binary gender was associated with a noticeable effect on stress. These differences between genders may resonate with invisible structural inequalities in the higher music education system. Of further note is the topic of specific study programs, whose related professions, particularly in music education and church music, often require multi-instrumentalism. Students in these fields thus often have more study and instrument specific demands than students in classical music study programs, resulting in a higher workload and increased learning challenges. In addition, both the junior and doctoral levels of study are particularly associated with the stress. This may be related to the fact that junior students study music while in high school. While on the other end of the spectrum, doctoral students often have other work and family commitments. I also wanted to figure out how these dissertations, results and findings could be used to develop pedagogical practices and educational policies. Based on music students' experiences, 43 constructive tools for teachers were created to support music students in managing and coping with their workload in higher education. For example, one of these tools is related to teachers' interaction with students when teachers give feedback. It is important for teachers to understand that harsh and overly critical feedback affects students' mental health. Good feedback encourages and motivates students to practice even harder, and constructive critical feedback pushes students to increase practicing, practicing time. When students are overloaded, they are not able to handle feedback of any sort. In my dissertation, I provide four general recommendations for good practice. The first recommendation suggests that higher music education should support music students' proactive coping skills. That minimizes their minimize distress and maladaptive coping during their studies. As I mentioned earlier, there are differences between genders in using proactive coping styles, and these differences should be acknowledged to develop better support systems for music students. The second recommendation suggests that higher music education institutions should find solutions to the unequal workload and stress experiences between low-income and well-off students, different genders and different study programs. Higher music education institutions could acknowledge students' diverse backgrounds, change the competitive atmosphere to a more cooperative university culture and utilize more diverse sources of knowledge in developing study programs. 
diverse, diverse sources do not mean adding more content to the courses and demands on students. Instead, it means that administrators and teachers should start to consider what to leave out from the current overloaded structures. It means rethinking study programs in a way that utilizes students' wishes to be able to combine studying and working in order to benefit their learning and careers. It means support for students from the beginning of their study so that they can find individual and meaningful study paths. The third recommendation suggests that higher music education should ensure teachers continuing professional development, particularly in learner-centered pedagogical approaches. Understanding music students' experience workload may also enable teachers to improve, improve their students' learning experiences more generally. Constructivist learning theory suggests that it is possible to support students being active learners when the teaching is connected to their prior knowledge and students have enough time to process new information. At this point, when I mention teachers, uh, people often ask, what about teachers' workload? That is a good question, and it affects the resources that they have to support students' learning and well-being. However, that important question should be aimed at higher music education institutions so that it does not overshadow the issue with students' workload. Indeed, the final recommendation suggests that higher music education should invest resources in providing for more research investigating students' experiences. For example, curriculum-related decision directly impacts students' workload. But administrators and teachers all too often make these decisions without robust evidence. There is so much valuable data gathered in the institutions from the students through innumerable questionnaires, and yet very little of that data is analyzed and then utilized to develop pedagogical practices and educational policies. In light of this, I want to raise a question targeted at the higher music education institutions. Why there is no full-time researcher or even several researchers who concentrate on collecting, analyzing, and providing usable reports from your students' feedback. I do not mean only percentages and statistics, but especially students' experiences from their everyday lives. To end my lecture, Precursoria, I want to remind the higher music education institutions that my dissertation includes many valuable examples of music students' experiences that can be utilized as decision-making tools. This is one way in which institutions could develop better study environments that help make the experiences of workload and stress manageable for all music students. Music students should get enough support of the right kinds to have successful, healthy and enjoyable study experiences that prepare them for their professional careers. To illustrate a vision for that kind of stu study environment, I will end here uh, with the words of a research participant who described the optimal workload while studying music. There are kind of op optimal circumstances for me so that I can feel comfortable and I know that I now have enough time, and I don't need to stress about it. I hereby call upon your honor opponent as the examiner appointed by the Academy Board at the Sibelius Academy to evaluate my doctoral dissertation and to present the critical comments you deem it deserves.
Thank you, Tula, for the opportunity to read your thesis and take part in this discussion today. It's a great privilege to play a role in the evaluation of this important and timely body of work on a topic which affects all of us involved in music education. This is a thoroughly researched dissertation that contributes to our understanding of music students' experiences of overload, stress and coping, whilst also making practical recommendations for the development of curricula, teaching and support services in higher education. This dissertation reports on two stages of a much larger four-stage research project, the Music Students Workload Project, which took place across Finland and the United Kingdom. Following stages one and two, the pilot and exploratory stages, which are reported elsewhere, the dissertation provides an extended summary of the third stage and part of the fourth stages of the project, the explanatory and synthesis stages. The overarching research question and related sub-questions are addressed in a systematic manner through the various chapters of the dissertation and relate to the four published articles. There is evidence of an in-depth and thorough engagement with a wide range of literature from general higher education, along with material from other areas such as psychology, music education, health and well-being. Students' experiences of overload, stress and coping are tested against a number of variables. Along with qualitative data, the findings are used to inform, as we've, as we've heard, a set of 43 constructive tools for teachers to support in music students in their studies. So starting from the premise that students today are experiencing increased levels of stress and poor mental health, Tula makes the case that there are characteristics and features specific to music education that can exacerbate pressures on students as well as offset them. These features we've heard include performance anxiety, musculoskeletal strain problems, and the fact that music students have a great deal of personal investment in music and their identities as musicians. The systematic review showed that whilst the topic of workload for students in higher education had been studied in general, there was not much existing research specific to music students. Therefore, the specific focus on music students makes a welcome contribution to both the music education and then back again to the general higher education literatures. A key benefit of the systematic review was in revealing the complexity of trying to define and conceptualize workload. Workload cannot be adequately studied just by logging credits and course hours. Its experience is subjective, depending on the meaning and satisfaction ascribed to the task by each individual. Furthermore, Students have varying degrees of workload outside of their study-related activities and need to work for a living, establishing professional contacts and other life commitments, such as caring responsibilities and for junior students going to school. One of the most important contributions of this dissertation is the care it takes in building a nuanced understanding of potential factors that can affect students' experiences of workload, stress and coping in music education. In addition to expanded concepts of workload, the research draws from Greenglass et al.'s proactive coping inventory for adolescents. The choice to do this draws on Greenglass's argument that most stress-related research uncovers reactive strategies that people use after they are already stressed. The research establishes a relationship between students' lack of reported stress and their use of various proactive coping strategies. That is, th things they did that meant they didn't experience stress or overload in the first place, despite a full load of commitments. In learning more about students' use of proactive coping strategies, this dissertation makes an important contribution to curriculum development that is based on what students have found to be useful. And it also perhaps goes some way in heading off critiques on the rise of well-being as a central concern in education today. The main point of contention is that by focusing excessively on students as stressed, students and teachers are encouraged to position students as automatically fragile and vulnerable. This, it is suggested, is to the detriment of their well-being and of course goes against the intentions of this work. Proactive coping strategies replace perhaps these stereotypical images of students as worn down and passive, with students as having agency to meet the demands of their work. 
Perhaps the most surprising findings of this research for me were around classical music performance students' workload. The famed need to be practising all hours of the day and night is one of the factors that marks out music students from other students in higher education. Our expectations might be that the demands of daily instrumental practice might have predicted an experience of overload. However, this was not found compared to students of other genres. The observation that positive meaning and satisfaction that music students find in their studies can offset or replace feelings of overload and stress is, I suggest, a significant one. And it should also give us pause for thought and further investigation that music education students and church musicians seem to experience the greatest workload. The sample sizes for these musicians were comparatively small, but perhaps future research could start with more detailed descriptions of what these courses entail, including objective course handbook measures, hours and credits to check that the curriculum is not designed to be overloaded in the first place. Tula did point towards multi-skilled demands of some of these musicians, and it would be of great interest to see whether task switching, for instance, between different roles or instruments or combining academic study with practical music making, is perceived as more stressful than courses that comprise mostly performance on a single instrument. Finally, I would like to speak to the findings around extracurricular paid work, as I think these are important. It was found that if extracurricular work could be linked to future career goals, then students experience this as a benefit, despite it inevitably contributing to a greater workload. This has interesting implications for the development of courses that use work-based learning. Could music education partnerships with ensembles or professional contexts create opportunities for students to both earn money and develop professional contacts? We know that contextual learning is important in vocational training, for the acquisition of tacit skills and competencies that one picks up by osmosis from the environment and the people in it. If working professionally while still a student also contributes to greater well-being through career building, should we be taking this more seriously? So Tula, I now welcome the opportunity to discuss this work with you. So you have already told us what led um, from your journey from being administrator, working alongside students to being a researcher who studies them. Could you talk us now through your journey as a doctoral student and maybe some of the, the paths you took where you found surprising things or moments where you changed direction in thought? Uh, do you mean changing direction uh, in research or in my administrative? Uh, in research. Yes. Uh, in the beginning, I was interested in uh, the research of approaches to learning. I mean, uh, there were questionnaires available in general higher education fields about students' approaches to learning. That was my initial uh, research topic. But very soon I noticed that we cannot apply that in information direct, directly to the music students. So uh, first, we should go more deeply into the music student experiences. What is it to study music in the field of higher education? And um, uh, then I, I found that uh, it, it was specifically related to workload and stress when, uh, when I was uh, figuring out the, the how the music students experience their they studies. I also... Uh, interviewed teachers, music teachers, here in the Sibelius Academy uh, to mm. learn more about, about uh, studying music. I think this is a good point uh, to note also to the audience that I'm not a musician by myself, so my interest has been just as an administrator to research music students' experiences. Of course, it could have been another field. If I had been working, for example, in other university when I had the opportunity to start doctoral studies, I could have been researching those students. So that is a lovely coincidence that I, I became in interested in music students' experience. 
Thank you. Um, I would like next to talk about the, the overall context of stress and workload in your work. So um, I'm curious about the overall higher education context as you see it. So you mentioned early on that higher education has had to undergo unprecedented changes in recent decades. Mm. And then you also say that in music education, there are traditions that date back centuries. So in terms of the student experience, their stress and their workload, can you talk about what is a modern or recent phenomena that contributes to stress and workload and um, about also about phenomena that traditional ones that you feel contribute to stress and workload as well? Yes, that is a really important question because when I was going through the previous research, I found especially in Finland there has been research about students' workload and stress and it showed that uh, during these uh, Late, late, latest decades, uh, students has not uh, it, uh, they have have not felt so good. I mean, the distress has been increasing all the time. So, uh, and in these studies, uh, there was a conclusion that it might be related to the environmental factors that have changed the situation in higher education. But in higher music education, um, I think there has been lots of positive um, changes. I mean, pedagogy has been developed a lot in the higher music education institutions. Institutions, especially, there has been um, actions and research uh, to investigate the, the master apprentice model, one-to-one uh, -one tuition model, and. Uh, and to see uh, how how beneficial they are for for the students and how they should be changed and are they are they the best possible way to teach music students and uh, another thing is the situation with working besides studying so because of the higher education policies for example in the united kingdom that has changed in the last decade so uh, there there were uh, free higher education in, in, uh, since um, 1998, if I remember correctly, they changed to be uh, funded by the tuition fees. Mm -hmm. So that has direct impact to the students, of course. But th that, is a, that, that was then the, the reason why um, I was interested in, in to take another country in addition to Finland which have a different kind of higher, ed higher education system. So actually w one of the articles showed that the, the university culture affects students' experience stress. Um, thank you for that. I suppose um, actually one thing that I have to share with you when you were talking about um, modern stresses versus traditional ones is I remember reading, so I've done some historical research into conservators, but I remember reading that when the Royal Academy of Music opened in 1922, mm -hmm. a considerable stressor was that everyone was practicing all in the same room at the same time together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so luckily students are, well, we're all squeezed for space, but luckily students don't have that to contend with now. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in, um, in this idea of, of the one-to-one -one tuition system and, and vocational training being perhaps necessarily, well, not necessarily stressful, but it, it's a kind of constant that students have always uh, gone into music higher education. You know, those wanting to become professional musicians have always had this, um, I suppose, a burden of knowing that it is for their vocation. I mean, do you think that that has changed more in line in recent years with ex students experiencing more stress, or do you think that's always been a constant? Uh, among my research participants, it seemed that uh, students really enjoy and appreciate one-to-one -one tuition when the relationship, <coughs> interaction with the teacher works well. So uh, sometimes it, it, it seemed that uh, if it not worked well, that caused quite much stress and workload for the students. So. Uh, the issue is maybe there that because it happens between one, two persons in one room where, where nobody else cannot interfere, 
uh, there are some dangers that uh, there might happen things that uh, don't make uh, student workload feasible. So um, although students participants highlighted that they really appreciate, appreciate and hope that one to one tuition continues as a teaching model, but they also highlighted that when it it is not working well, that affects let's say mental health. Mm. Um, I would very much like to to return to that topic um, actually later on, but for now I just I'm wondering about um, vocational training as being a route to the music profession, and you say relatively little about the music profession. You know, you're very much focused on students and in higher education, mm. but I was wondering um, if you could elaborate what you know about the the situation in the, uh, the music profession and how that might have changed. Um, you know, what, what is the kind of demand for students? What is the demand for musicians and the likelihood of students proceeding on to jobs? Yes, uh, when uh, I and my research team, we were coding the data, the qualitative data, there were two um, codes uh, which we found related to music profession. It was musician career and the meaning of musicianship. So those t topics were important to research participants and uh, thinking about the future, their future in the music profession, uh, they were worried about it. And they thought that they, they, ha they get models from day one to one uh, teachers about their own teacher's career. But if they have some ideas to do something else or try to be proactive, uh, to make possible that they get a job right away when they graduate, they couldn't find help for that. So they we said that um, there will be available more diverse ways of uh, doing music mus musician musician as a profession. So mm. that is something which I noticed that um, too often in the higher music education institutions who participated uh, in my research. Uh, there is available only a model to be some kind of a pro um, traditional musician in orchestra or that kind of or music teacher or that, or that kind of thing. But no, I think nowadays uh, there should be more diverse ways mm. to show, show students how they could uh, be prepared for their future careers. And what I mentioned in my lecture um, is that uh, the students should get help right in the beginning of their studies, uh, support to find the meaningful study paths and ways that they can find their career also during their studies. But maybe I well, it's good to say uh, here that, uh, of course, because I'm not a musician, that was something that uh, I couldn't really um, go deep, maybe participants would have liked to discuss more about the musician profes profession, but because that is not my profession, that was one weak thing probably in my research that maybe I couldn't find the, the important things that they would have liked to continue in the interviews, for example. So uh, I'm really glad that you raised that that topic because it's something that should be researched in the future, especially in what is mus music profession in related to the music students. I mean, how 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 they are related when thinking about music student workload and how these music nowadays uh, these current music students what are they going to bring to the music profession when they graduate? Um, thank you. Yes, I have a, a couple of thoughts in relation to what you said. So one is, um, I mean, I wondered in the students that you interviewed, did you gain a sense of um, difference in their thinking? Because you've, you've said that you think that first year students in particular mm. need more support. Um, did you find that students became more career minded or more, um, more open to different kinds of ways of being a musician as they went through their studies? Or did you find that that stayed the same? Uh, when thinking about those who were uh, talking about their first year ex first years experiences, I must say that 
they were not related to uh, musician career. They may they were more related to the uh, to the stage when they are going to be uh, independent and there are lots of things uh, changing when they have moved from their homes to live alone and when they try to figure out what is it to study in higher education. So in the first year, they, they were more worried about what is the right way to, how I can manage uh, in higher education and uh, what is this to study in higher education. So um, uh, if I recall correctly, the, those uh, musician careers uh, where the students, participants were mostly concerned when they had studied for a while in higher music education. Um, my also thought, uh, other thought, and this is actually more of a, a comment rather than a question, is that um, something I came across recently suggested that um, it was recently graduated students uh, perhaps might be ideally suited to mentoring students who are studying because the, their teachers and professors who had been established for many years uh, didn't really have a, you know, their careers had already been established and they mm. had a completely different idea of what it was to be starting mm. out. So that might be something that mm. you that you think about in in, in relation to your um, suggestion for how to take things forward. Yeah. Um, so I want to to return sort of to my theme of kind of exploring overall concepts. So, um, what is your definition of stress? I know it's a word that we use a lot, and then suddenly it's like, oh, but actually, what are we talking about here? Yes. Uh, actually. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning that I was interested in the research approaches to learning, uh, but I changed it to the workload and stress of music students uh, because there was a, in Finland, there was a available uh, validated questionnaire about approaches to learning and workload and stress. That uh, questionnaire uh, had been tested and used widely even in the United Kingdom. So, uh, the workload and stress items had been taken for my research from that learn questioner. So at, when I ma made the decision to take that part of the questioner, uh, I also followed the definition of stress and it has uh, been defined in the questioner and explained also to the research participants that here the stress means uh, when you are feeling overwhelmed or things are constantly haunting in your mind. So th that kind of thing for the students, especially that there are so many things going on all the time that you are feeling that you cannot manage them. Um, and, and was there a sense, because uh, obviously, you know, you can feel those things for an hour or you can feel those things for an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you have that in your definition or was it just a sort of self-reporting stress? It was uh, self-reporting stress and that that's a good point i think because i have been thinking because i was interested in experiences and i i remember that one reviewer in one article it it was probably related to that uh, coping stress article he mentioned that please remember to write there that these are report reported not experiences then i was thinking what is the difference i mean if the student is reporting uh, something. It is experience. I mean, it's not uh, more valuable if it has been measured, for example, with the oral ring <laughs> or something like that. Isn't it valuable when students tell that I'm feeling stress? I is that the most valuable thing to measure stress? Of course, of course, I suggest the. Uh, in the limitations of that article that um, there could be a combination that there could be some measures of bodily stress uh, connected to the reported stress but still i'm i'm wondering why why we should appreciate it technically measure stress more than students reported stress mm -hmm. um and i suppose on that theme, I mean, education itself has been characterised as necessarily challenging, um, hard work, and a site of uh, transformation and identity changing. 
Um, and these experiences in themselves are not necessarily enjoyable or comfortable, mm -hmm. um, you know, especially sort of you know, undergoing transformation or changing identity. So, um, no, I was wondering, with this in mind, is, is your conclusion that um, findings show that music students experience workload both as a challenge and as a source of positive learning experience? Is that a demonstration that actually all things considered, music students and their institutions are doing just fine? Yes, a little bit. I mean, I know that because I have been working in the administration, that administrators, teachers, and managers, they are doing a lot. They really try to help students to feel good and, and enjoy their studies. And the strange question is, why did the things are not changing? I mean, uh, the administrators are overloaded, teachers are overloaded, everybody is overloaded. Why the stories from the students were not telling you mostly that uh, I'm so happy. I, as I had example in the, in the end of my lecture, uh, I have enough time and I enjoy playing my instrument. That was a, a tiny part. I mean, the mostly part were about overload and that kind of things. But uh, it was, um, interesting finding when we had an international research team, and I also mentioned it in the dissertation, that the concept of workload could have been understood differently uh, among UK participants and Finland participants, because in Finland the term workload, kuormittavuus, it, not, it is not negative, necessarily negative. But uh, the final sentence in my dissertation, it's kind of positive. I wanted it to be a positive. I wanted to also show to the higher music education institution, to the students and, and to the teachers and administrators. I have seen, we have seen how much you want to help the students. And we have seen that music, music students really enjoy the topic, the subject which they are studying. So. Uh, I couldn't end the dissertation uh, highlighting the issues and challenges because I think in the future research it should be acknowledged uh, to look also to the positive side. The positive sides can guide then where to go, where are the good parts of, of students' experiences that we could follow. And as you mentioned, uh, studying is not only enjoying, it is stressful, it's workload. But if uh, students could have better ways to uh, better ways to face those challenges when they enter into higher education, uh, they could manage um, a little bit better with those challenges, and they will need those those skills in the future careers as well. So uh, I think that uh, the both sides are important. Although I must admit that. Uh, um, students may were more worried about the overload than that also that uh, maybe it was 80 percent they were worried about the overload and 20 percent when they remember remember to mention in the interviews that I love it I I love to perform I love music music is everything uh, for me so that could be something which could be considered in the future research how we could balance this. Mm. Um, I think as well it would be very interesting to talk to alumni about their reflections mm. you know, after after the event because I think there are there are things which people reflect on and in retrospect find fulfilling whereas at the time you're not necessarily mm. enjoying it. Um, yes I'm sure you are thinking back to doctoral study. <laughs> <laughs> so um, could you talk a bit about what you did include in the concept of workload? Um, the workload, we, uh, our research team defined it in the systematic literature review, carefully. So I look into the thesaurus uh, in Finland, what is workload as a concept. So um, that, that was the moment where I decided to include also the positive aspects of it. So because in Finland workload, is quite no neutral, and so it, it can include underload, which is not necessarily good, 
or overload. So, but then uh, with my research team, we noticed that in, in the United Kingdom, uh, workload is almost similar to an overload. So I tried to highlight that it's not overload. And that was how I prepared the questionnaire also that it was not pointing to the only the hard bars. There were questions, please uh, describe when the workload is light, please describe when the workload is appropriate. So I wanted that students could describe it as wide as possible. Um, thank you. I, I was wondering whether, because you, you make a case that, um, that you weren't going to look at narrow definitions of workload, so you weren't just going to look at objective measures mm -hmm. of, of course credits and timing. Um, but then you also mention that uh, students have too much to do at assessment times. Yeah, that was an example you gave at assessment times. They have too much to do, and then at mm. other times there was not very much going on. So, um, and along with that, I've also seen that there's been objections that course credits for students, uh, particularly in Europe, are actually um, calculated to be over and above professional working week limits. So I wondered whether... Um, whether there was more work to be done using a narrower definition of workload, just to, just to make sure that we're not asking, like on paper objectively, we're not asking too much of students. Yeah, I think that's a really good suggestion. I mean, uh, as you mentioned in, in, in the, your speech in the beginning, that there should be some kind of measures urgently made, uh, made in the study programs. Is the workload, measured workload appropriate there, and why it's not appropriate when comparing the study programs. Although I criticize that the workload cannot be measured only as an objective workload, like grades and credits, of course, it's very important thing there. It should be mm -hmm. also measured. Maybe it should be started there if higher music education institution would like to start to change. I know with the Bologna process, uh, there, there were some kind of measures coming that one credit relates to certain amount of hours. And I know, I have seen, I have been doing as an administrator that work too, that uh, we make those measures and we try to measure. But of course, teachers, uh, oh, they are different. I mean, when they plan the content and add, the con we never know what exact teacher teaches and add there to the content of the course. The, they are they are written in a really general way the the requirements for the for the courses. But I think what the research participants highlighted highlighted that it really helps with their workload if they know in advance the real amounts of workload and what is expected and when. That was maybe the, the one of the most challenges that they were not able to know. As I mentioned in my speech that uh, there are lots of uh, commitments with the ensembles and other groups for the, for the music students. So a little change in teachers' schedule affects the many, many schedules in the music students. And that is uh, not, not such a big problem in many other fields. You know, when they have exams, the exams have has been mentioned, it's that day and that time. Students can read when they have a one minute there, one hour there, mm -hmm. but music students ha have so many schedules to tackle with. Um, I think this, uh, whilst I, I do applaud your sort of wider um, overview of the w concept of workload, I do think that um, it would be really useful to just get objective measures in there. Otherwise, mm. I think there's a there's a danger in um, by putting a focus on students with proactive coping strategies, we're asking them to cope with um, demands that are actually unreasonable in the first mm, place. Exactly. So it's, you know, it's a kind of structural problem, mm. but we're saying students, it's up to you to cope mm. with it. I would like to say here uh, what I have been what what I have been wondering. Uh, as I mentioned in my speech that uh, music students have started they studying music already as a child and they have got used to uh, require a lot of themselves. I can expect that they are not they are master to avoid procrastination because they have they have learned to 
use the practice schedules since childhood when compared to other students who start a subject in the university. So if music students tell about their, uh, that they, they have difficulties to manage with the amount of the workload, could it be quite reliable? Because we know that they, they, they really know how to requ require uh, practicing times and they, they have been prepared to plan schedules and they have got used to be flexible in practicing when concert is coming and letting other things in their life apart for that one. So if music students say that now, now this is too much, could, could we be sure that they really know what they are talking about? Yes, I think another way of putting that is that it's unlikely that music students are just lazy. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> so. Um, I want to talk a bit now about um, your methods and methodology for this research. So it was a, a multi-phase project. Um, could you tell us a bit about how your research design evolved? You've already uh, told me a bit about how it started with um, the questionnaire. Yeah. And, yeah, but do you want to talk about that? Already when choosing that questionnaire, uh, it uh, set some uh, requirements to use both quantitative and qualitative when I included also open-ended questions to the questioner. And I was, a, I was really interested to uh, learn to use statistical methods. I thought that uh, higher education maybe could benefit for, for, from the researchers who master both qualitative and quantitative methods. I couldn't <laughs> do quantitative research when I started uh, my doctoral studies, but um, we had a really nice uh, doctoral, doctoral study program, so we are really encouraged to, to follow our study paths, and uh, we got funding, so um, I took some extra courses in University of Helsinki, and uh, there I had a really inspiring statistical uh, specialist and teacher who had this kind of new kind of approaches to teaching. He utilized this kind of open, open access teaching. So although I was the worst, I was not so advanced as the other students, um, they were openly available to other students' materials. So I learned with that research method quite much. And uh, that is why I was interesting to take even some new methods like or approach like the Bayesian approach. So when I, I was familiar with the frequentist approach, I thought that uh, there could be maybe, maybe I could manage to do that. And I got help from the specialist, of course, in the statistical page. And um, I chose that Bayesian, especially because I wanted to find a statistical method which could be utilized in the higher music education where the study program, the number of students are really limited in the study program. Mm. I think that, that was what I was going to ask is, um, of course, doctoral training, it's, it's a great benefit to, to study or to get as many kind of methods under your belt as yeah. possible. Um, but what, what, what did you feel it um, benefited you? Because um, at one point you say that uh, you really want to kind of bring forth the student voice, which of course, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a kind of interview. Yeah. Um, so with the, with the quantitative side of things, what, what was it that you felt that enabled you to access the deep ex experiences of the students. Yeah. I must say that uh, with the open-ended answers, which was the quality of that data as well, uh, I was able to find lots of interesting things, but in the interviews, I could especially go deep into deeper level and also feel the participants' emotions when they talk about uh, their experiences. So, um, it, in the interviews were really important for this research, not only for the research topic, but for myself. And as you mentioned earlier, in the music student workload pro project, there was, there was also this exploratory stage, which was important for me. And uh, there are uh, some articles where I go really deep into music students' experiences, just to learn by myself about them, because I, I'm not a musician by myself. Mm. Um, but with 
but yeah, with the with the quantitative, if you'd just had your study as being interviews, mm. um, how do you think that would have been different from? You know, what do you think the quantitative aspects brought to your study? Really good question. I think this could have been conducted as a qualitative research if the researcher had been a musician. Uh, I think th that as an administrator background and as a non-musician, I could add something more and uh, concentrate on those skills which are needed to be able to conduct that kind of research. So, and I think uh, uh, that the quantitative results may have significant impact now in higher music education institutions. For example, uh, when we think about the differences between genders and using proactive coping st styles or experiencing stress or study programs. I'm sure that the head of those study programs, if they read this study, they, they, they must now think seriously if the measures have shown that that there are really differences between study programs. There, there must be some action. So um, I'm wondering in, in that, um, do you think that quantitative, quantitative data is valued more for administrators than qualitative? Uh, yes and no, um, because I, I have actually been, uh, as an administrator, responsible for uh, providing some uh, um, percentage and means from the collected feedback. I have been taking care of the feedback questionnaires in, in my previous uh, administrative work. I know that um, there are really good uh, developmental access in the universities nowadays that they provide monthly or uh, once per semester for the heads of the study programs. They provide those measures they show that uh, in this uh, course uh, feedback questionnaire, these kind of results were, were, were combined and gathered. But I also know that the head of study programs are so busy that they might have time to take a look. Okay, yes, that looks good, good, good and usable report. But there be, should be somebody who brings the qualitative part to it. I mean, who brings the emotions from the students, who brings the, the words uh, from the students to explain. Of course, there are diverse experiences and uh, it's really important to bring those diverse experiences, not only the numbers, the means. So I think the statistical uh, data and quantitative uh, research is maybe Value, more valuable, it's thought to be more valuable, but uh, in the practical work, it's not so. Um, yeah, an another question about, um, I suppose, like the sample and the amount of students involved. So your study took place across two countries and you had many potential in uh, institutions to involve. So you had, a, I think you say at one point, you had a potential uh, pool of over, what was it, of over 5,000 students. Mm. Um, however, you only got 155 students answered your call to take part in this research, which is you know, which is quite a common phenomenon, isn't mm, it? Just yeah. getting people to answer emails. Um, so you mentioned research that shows that small sample sizes needn't challenge the validity of research data. Mm. Um, however, in what ways do you think that your small sample size did impact your research findings? Uh, I think uh, when we researchers face the small sam sample sizes, they are not a bad thing, but the, the most important thing is to report them correctly. You must, uh, you must write down the limitation. You must show that uh, these results were, were gathered because of uh, this kind of sample and these uh, results can be applied only for this group, not the population level. So, uh, but at the same time, I think this, uh, you have, to, uh, like reviewers often <laughs> mention, you have uh, two small sample. That is so easy to say, uh, I mean, and it discourages even the researchers. Okay, I just got this amount of uh, participants. Let's not research this topic at all. 
actually, in the Bayesian approach, there is not two small sample sizes. You can conduct Bayesian statistical uh, research uh, even when you have one participant. And that's because Bayesian approach use this kind of a priori approach. So there can be th this kind of a priori which define how you approach the, the research research then. So it already defines it closer to, mm. the, to the actual topic. So I argue actually that uh, reviewers, please, don't write there you have too small sample size. Write there, thank you researcher that you are researching this topic. Um, but would you, would you then modify, because we were talking about using the results of that research to make generalizations and move into kind of policy. Mm -hmm. So would you then, uh, beyond saying thank you to the research for researching <laughs> the topic, <laughs> would you then adjust your claims going forward into, um, into the decisions you make around policy? Do you mean the statistical results or...? Uh, yes, I mean, I'm just like an example that you gave was, um, say, non-binary non gender yes. students. So I, I think, um, from looking at your tables, you know, the amount of students that that applied to was yes. actually very small. Um, so at, at that point, it seems to me that you're, uh, you know, you have results, you have findings, but you're speculating when you're trying to um, make recommendations for yes. practice. Uh, Actually, uh, with the non-binary gender results about the stress and using emo, especially the result of st stress that they are experiencing more stress than male students, uh, was achieved with the Bayesian modeling, the ordinal property regression modeling. And uh, of course, the reviewer mentioned that you have so small sample size. So then I contacted uh, an expert in the field in the Oxford University and discussed about this problem, about too small sample size. And uh, I learned there that, that uh, it's not, uh, there is <laughs> not too <laughs> small sample size. Also, the, no, uh, the Bayesian modeling, uh, it creates thousands and thousands of models and then chooses uh, the one which could be utilized with, with the modeling such as that this is, um, this is now measured and this is the result. So uh, with, when achieving the result of th three non-binary respondents that they are experiencing more stress than male students, it's a valid result mm -hmm. because the ordinal property regression modeling has done lots of work, background, creating different kind of models and, and then suggesting this model. So although there were only few, a few of the non-binary gender students, uh, the result is really, really valid. And I think it's really important uh, to also um, mention in this dissertation, the issue with the non-binary gender students that I noticed that uh, they don't use emotional support seeking, which is important when you need support, for example, in your first years, that somebody gives you emotional support. So this is something that higher music education institutions should maybe think uh, also in relation to other minority uh, groups that uh, how general is their support model? Uh, how is it? Uh, targeted? Is it targeted to those people who already followed uh, the, the usual identities? But how about those students who struggle in the, when they enter university? They are not sure about their identity and they would need some different kind of support for that. So if we look at my results, if I check that the non-binary gender students don't use emotional support seeking coping style and still they experience more stress than male students. Is this a sign that they try to uh, try to find out, uh, find, figure out and solve their problems on their own? Mm. 
Yeah, no, I thought that that was a, a very good point that you, you drew from that um, and one that's like very worthy of pursuing. So I also had a question uh, more, more on uh, sampling. So this is about who signed up to take part in your research. Mm. So um, you know, I was wondering about self-selection bias. Um, and mm -hmm. so I, I suppose I base this speculative observation on the high percentage of female mm -hmm. students who took part, um, a group who also reported high levels of stress. So do you think that only students who are already experiencing stress and overload might have been attracted to taking part in a study because finally someone was giving them a, a voice? Yes, for sure. I think they, they will. They students were so happy that they had a possibility now to speak about it and finally say that, uh, hey, oh, thank you, somebody is asking about their workload. But it might also be that those who are in a danger of burnout or who has a really stressful uh, period going on, they don't have time to take part. I mean, there might be a group that they don't take part because they are so overloaded and stressed. So we don't, we cannot, it's only speculation, but I think this speculation is important and this could be something which could be researched in the future and especially by utilizing uh, Bayesian modeling. Th this is something we could find out with those, those tools mm -hmm. to figure out that, that uh, for example, uh, tr making a research and include all population of uh, study program or a population of um, but first year students maybe of course we cannot get all of them but as much as possible and then figure, try to figure out what was your workload and stress situation when you fill it in the questionnaire i think that is really really important that the speculation ends i mean that we get some kind of evidence who are those students who take part in this this kind of questionnaire mm. good question um, actually, I mean, you've partially answered my next question, which was, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, are there any other ways of sampling to try and reach more students? I mean, you mentioned just then, you know, maybe we we could get all first year students, but you know, how how might you do that practically? Yes, uh, there is a serious problem that nowadays even um, higher education, higher music education institutions are not willing to let go any service. Yeah. Uh, I, I faced that. I was luck, lucky that they, they the, the who helped me and gave research permissions, they thought that this is so important topic that let, let, let's go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let, you, can, you can conduct this. But uh, uh, of course there are more important topics, but of course uh, students, uh, this is something which is extra work for them. And uh, if they feel in questions, of, we everybody know uh, who have studied or worked in higher education that every course has a questionnaire. <laughs> so they fill in many questionnaires during their studies. And if they cannot see anything, I mean, resulting of it filling in questions, if there is no changes, although they mention once again and once again, please change this, this is not working, then uh, probably they just are not willing anymore to fill in those questionnaires. But I think this is a really compli complex problem. I mean, what to do with this uh, survey fatigue and this, uh, that higher music education are not willing to let the, them the service, any more research service. Uh, they are not disseminating them. And I don't know what to do. I think the best thing is that we show the students that Thank you for your valuable effort, and thank you. We are really, really making actions. And as I mentioned in my speech, there is so much data. Uh, it, if there were researchers who just uh, dive into that data, we could get so much valuable informat information from that. Somehow, year by year, we make the same questionnaires, and then we show the means and and. Uh, percentages and then the big questionnaire goes to some file so we don't come into administrators we don't come back we don't we don't have time I know there should be persons who really have time to take a closer look 
and who who have time in t- to make interviews with students, who have time to go thoroughly through the all feedback, open-ended feedback, and see that there are there is diverse opinions. They should be able to show those diverse op- opinions, not only show one. Here is one example of what the student has written with a question, and this is the common way of doing doing it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so you also uh, included doctoral and junior students, and I was wondering at what point did you decide to involve them in the research? Because I think they, they weren't there from the beginning. Yes, the questioner and the re- uh, the sheet, the information sheet, <laughs> was targeted and written to the bachelor and master students. But when the survey was going on, th- they started to come responses also from the doctoral students and the junior students. So I wanted to be inclusive. I wanted to uh, everyone who took time and uh, used their time and filled in the questionnaire, I wanted to give them back something. And actually that was then we can see from the results that there were differences also among doctoral students and junior junior students compared to other students. So it was it was a minimum uh, workload for me to include those respondents and still I could uh, give so much valuable information for the higher music education institutes from from them. That is some benefit from the statistical research that uh, with a really small workload you can include more people to that. I could have included more countries even if this has been a paid project, research project, not a side project that because I was a full, full, I had a full-time work in administration and I conducted my doctoral studies in the evenings and holidays. So um, if, I, if I had been that kind of a researcher which uh, university uh, would have paid full salary, not a research assistant salary, but the manager, <laughs> <laughs> then uh, I, would, uh, I would have included more countries, definitely. You heard it here. <laughs> um, so I was, um, yeah, I was very curious about your, your chosen analytical framework when you wrote about using transcendental phenomenology. Yeah. And um, uh, so I, I understand that you've sort of written another article about that. And then mm-hmm. at the very beginning of, of this dissertation, um, you, know, you use the words of that interview participant, music to me is everything. Um, you know, it's my life. I wouldn't be who I am without mm-hmm. music today. So I felt that this was uh, this aspect was really present, a kind of bubbling away as an undercurrent, but but not so developed in this dissertation because you'd written about it elsewhere. But could you talk a bit more about this uh, transcendental phenomenology and what it enabled you to access with your participants? Yes, uh, I must mention that the article "Music Is My Life" it has uh, became one of the most popular articles when I. I can follow the counts of the articles, although it's not open access. So still, uh, it's really popular. So uh, even research, m- researchers in higher music education or students, music students have found it so touching. <laughs> so, uh, and I have received a lot of good feedback. Thank you, thank you for writing about it. But I couldn't include it in this <laughs> dissertation. Uh, it has been too wide. Um, Transcendental phenomenology came across uh, to my doctoral study path when we had a qualitative research course and uh, we we had to read and learn about different kind of qualitative methods. And right away when I read about it, I know I knew that wow, this is something. There were two things which uh, were good. Uh, for there were scholars who had used in quite similar research this so I could follow a couple of articles how they had conducted a transcendental phenomenology approach study and see that that is that is really interesting and what was the most important thing that it was interested in experience human experience and transcendental phenomenology approach thinks that the human experience is especially important <laughs> in research. So 
it, it didn't think that it's only or an opinion or something like that. It thinks that it's the uh, most important thing to research. And I wanted to find that kind of a met approach or methodology which, uh, with which I can approach music student experiences in this way that I can consider them to be important. And uh, the, uh, then there was um, Musaka, who is the Mus Mustakas, who is the one who has been developing this uh, transcendental phenomenological approach, uh, has already then written quite one, one, two, three, four steps how to use it, and uh, I found that really helpful. I found that helpful as an administrators. Uh, for example, when I mentioned that when students write feedback, open-ended feedback, it should be somehow uh, utilized totally, not only one showing one example of the open-ended answers. There should be a way to go through all of them, uh, to acknowledge the diverse opinions and show how they how they were there and at, and show that all of them are important. So these were the most important things why I wanted to use that qualitative approach in my research. Although I must say that uh, when you conduct that kind of approach, uh, it uh, does not differ significantly from a thematic analysis. I mean, it's a thematic analysis. It, it just have this kind of um, exact steps which are easy to follow and it, it uh, really uh, explores uh, every experience. Um, well, that leads nicely on my next question, which is about the student voice. So um, I wondered with, uh, you know, you do this analysis and then, and then you get something which resembles thematic analysis, but uh, did you enter into dialogue with your students, um, either participants or other students, about your findings, or did you present your findings back to the students that you'd interviewed? Yes, uh, in the question, in the information sheet, I promise that uh, if you, if, if, the par if the research participants wants to get some information about research results or personal uh, results of when uh, responding to the proactive coping scale items or workload items, I will come back. And there were, many of them had left their email address, so now I have uh, sent them information about uh, that now this uh, research is ready and you can find information here and please reply to this email if, if you're interested in to get your own result of the proactive coping and workload and stress items. And I think that <coughs> this is something uh, which can be useful for students because the meaning is that I show how in general those for example, proactive coping styles were used, and what were the participants' um, results regarding? So there, the participant can see, okay, I I use emotional support system not so much. Maybe I could start to think about it. This is something what higher music education institutions could also utilize when I suggested in my speech that, that they should start to support students using proactive coping styles. Um, just out of interest, did, did your participants come back to you and... Yes, they did, yeah. Unfortunately, many of them probably are graduated because uh, the, I got the automatic response from the email that this is not anymore available. Mm -hmm. So that is something that future researchers, please remember to write there that put participants put there an email address that you use when you have graduated. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, in your findings using different statistical measures, you had some contradictory findings depending on what tool of analysis you used. Um, I think there was something about undergraduate students had more study workload, um, but then you found that junior and doctoral students experienced more stress. Mm. I mean, when you had contradictions like that, um, you know, how did you how did you explain them? Uh, I think uh, when you get the because I used fragmented statistics and Bayesian approach, and they are different. The fragmented statistics, I get the, the results which are statistically signi significant can be reported. So when 
I found statistically significant, significant results, I can be sure that this is important and I, uh, I should uh, make a note about this. So um, when I, uh, the differences between stress where, where from the Bayesian ordinal profit regression modeling and the effects, they are effects. And if I get that kind of result that the doctoral students, there is much more effect on stress than postgraduate or bachelor's student, then it is something that must be reported. So we should believe that and doctoral study pro programs could start to consider why it's so. I don't have that kind of that much explanation that is which should be maybe researched in the future to go more in detail in the study programs. Thank you. Um, so I want to move now on to uh, you know your, your tools for teachers, your recommendations. Um, in in all, I know you, you wrote an article with forty three recommendations, but out of all of that, which area would you be most keen to develop? Hmm. There are so many. <laughs> uh, the interaction between teacher and student is important, and that was maybe was one of the reasons why I chose the example for my lecture uh, about the feedback. It is interesting that all those research participants uh, mentioned that, of, of course, working beside studying caused the stress and uh, overlapping courses, but very often they say that. Uh, it took several days to somehow recover from interaction with the teacher, which was not working well. So that kind of workload has quite long impact. So uh, that is something which is not usually considered as a workload. I mean, because workload is something that comes from the course content or timetables, but it's I, I don't have statistical evidence for this, but what I heard from the research participants that it has serious and long affecting impact of, uh, if the, there are this kind of personal mm -hmm. conflict or not even conflict, because a student is, uh, although you mentioned that we maybe shouldn't so much highlight that students are only vul vulnerable people, but they are. Of course, they don't have so much power in, in higher education and um, they, ha they must be careful when they think about their future careers because uh, the field of music is somehow limited and if you, if you try to change something or uh, want to change something, it might have effects on your future career. So uh, it's not so easy for the students to affect for that kind of thing. So that's why maybe I want, want to highlight the, the interaction. Not only teachers and students, also peer students, the juries and um, administrators. So uh, as I mentioned, students are young people and they are searching for their identity. They have so many stressful things going on in their lives as a young people. Of course, there are also, uh, not everybody is young people, so there are many kind of students, but however, uh, maybe somebody could, uh, could uh, suggest that you must be hard. Don't take feedback in individually and, and uh, don't care about it. But uh, young people, they don't have that kind of skills. I must say that I have learned that kind of skills now when I'm a little bit younger <laughs> <laughs> or older. <laughs> um, so, I mean, like the suggestion, many of your suggestions involve teachers and, and developing teachers. Um, so I was curious because we know teachers don't look at education research and some view it mm. with suspicion. So, um, you know, what are your developing ideas for engaging teachers? Because without that, I see that you have this sort of um, you know, really useful body of research on one hand, um, and then you have teachers potentially out here on another hand. Mm. And you know, how do you get the two to come together? Mm. Yes, 
As an administrator, I'm happy to see, for example, when I was working here in the Sibelius Academy, that here research is really appreciated. I mean, I'm a music education teacher, so um, that is good development action, which has been taken already. But of course, it's about the resources, what the teachers has. Um, I think it most useful would be that teachers could be researchers at the same time when they teach. So they would they would be able to research those things which they knew that they could be useful for their own teaching and that kind of things. But it's not, I know how overloaded teachers are nowadays, so it's just a, this kind of suggestion. But, but anyway, um, research can be a way to change things, I think. And that's why I, I cannot really understand why hi higher education institutions, not only higher music education, but in general, why there is no resources for, for that kind of thing that, for example, uh, when students enter university, it would be interesting to, uh, to make this kind of longitudinal research every year and follow what happens to them. There could be a researcher who, who make reports of that kind of data. That, that could be the way to develop the entrance examinations or support systems and that kind of thing. So there's so many things that should be researched uh, from the students. And still, I don't know any university which has a researcher who investigates student feedback. Um, so you mentioned teachers as researchers. What about teachers as a subject of research? Do we need, if we, ne if we need to change things, if we need to know more about students and their experience, do we mm. also need to know more about teachers and their experiences? Ex exactly. I'm sure that many things should be changed to ease into students' workload and, and that's something to, uh, as you know, uh, the one theoretical approach is the I uh, criticize or introduce neoliberal culture, uh, which is uh, affecting a lot, lot to the university cultures as well. So um, it's not only persons or institutions; it's uh, it's there in the basement of the societies and the higher education systems that what should be figured out and then making even tiny changes there. Um, when I was reading through your, you know, your, your 43 tools, I was, um, I was, I had sort of a couple of things in my mind and, and one was, um, you know, yes, this kind of need to develop, to develop teachers. Um, but then another, I, I kind of went to an earlier point in your dissertation where you said that uh, Norton points to the importance of clarifying the extent to which teachers should be considered responsible for their students' general and musical development. And I was just wondering about um, a couple of things. One was about sort of boundaries with teachers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've mentioned on the one hand that teachers should be uh, more sympathetic, maybe should take more of responsibility for students' mental health, but then on the other hand, if that doesn't mm -hmm. go well, it can have devastating consequences. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering about that, um, and then you know, balancing that with, we need to be doing more, you know, who needs to be doing mm -hmm. more, and, and can we expect that to be all concentrated, or should we want that to be concentrated in you know, one person, the one-to-one -one teacher? Yes, that, that's a really good question, and I think that's why there are 43 uh, tools. I mean, higher music edu education institute, institutions could, of course, they it's not possible to change everything <laughs> at once. So take uh, one or two and think, is this something that we could uh, start to discuss in the um, higher education institution, uh, even discuss and make things uh, visible is something where to start. And um, if um, students are feeling overloaded and have tried to give feedback about how to change the things, I'm sure teachers had done the same. They have expressed that the situation cannot go, go on like this. I, I cannot manage this anymore. And if there are more tasks, they cannot manage 
them too. So uh, I think the, the important thing is it, the responsibility is in the higher music education institutions to s start to change these things. Not it's not a teacher's responsibility or, or students' responsibility. It's everybody everybody's responsibility. But anyway, the institutions are in first hand responsible. Thank you. Um, I was also wondering about um, your, I mean, I really liked your suggestion about having a, um, a more kind of cooperative general ethos in higher education rather than one that was sort of very competitive. Um, how do you reconcile that with um, both the need for students to get through hoops of exams or, you know, there has to be some kind of summative assessment point? Mm. And also the realities of the, the music profession. You know, the music profession is not an incredibly kind place. Yes. The, uh, that's, that's a good question too, and uh, um, uh, that is something what the research participants uh, highlighted, that the, the, the competition causes workload and stress. Of course, they didn't have any suggestions how they could change that. For example, social media was a particular <laughs> uh, stressor. Uh, if you compare a student in other fields, and somebody uh, mentioned that, uh, yeah, I passed the exam. You can feel happy for your peer student, but when you see a, a geek, uh, a video of geek where your, co your peer students are doing so well and, and you know that you don't have time at the moment to, to do that, that's, that's a difference. I mean, uh, of course, in social media, also music students, they post their successful <laughs> things. And you, you cannot see how many hours they are behind. And uh, they have been practicing, they have been uh, taking their uh, instruments uh, by car to other place, and they have put lights there, and so much workload indeed. And when you look at that, it shows, oh, cool, five minutes. So. Uh, and when other peer students look at that and notice that they don't have time to do, they know what, what it requires, mm -hmm. that kind of five minutes perfect geek moment. So uh, it's not the same for the other students where, where one, one passes the exam. So there are specific uh, ways how, how the competition affects music students. Um, just hearing you speak now, it reminds me of, um, there is actually at UCL, University College London, so they've now uh, attempted to change all their degrees, the, the summative assessment points, so each student produces a portfolio of their work. So I think that would be really interesting in the mm. light of what you say, rather than trying to get rid of social media competition, because mm. that's kind of here to stay, or trying to um, do something on top of assessments. Um, this idea that like even at undergraduate level, um, do you think that would be something interesting to look at? Yes, if students experience that useful. So I think the most important should be asked from the students first, that the, is this the way that you, you feel that supports your learning? Is this the way that you can see that the workload is manageable? Uh, is this the way that uh, does not disturb your uh, practicing hours when there are one-to-one -one teachers requiring to <laughs> this level and this level. So when, when suggesting new ways of assessing or new courses, there should be all, always considered the whole package at the same time. I think this, it's good to mention at this point that music students really love the curriculum. I mean, it's uh, they they don't complain. They they really love that there are, there are so many courses available and uh, good courses, and th they really think that the, the the quality of teaching is a high level. But they choose too many courses, and they know the problem by themselves. They want to learn those things, and uh, they are interested in that and that, and they think that this could be useful for their career. And at this point, I was thinking that how, how much responsibility we can put on the young people's or fresh um, 
university student's shoulder to be able to define what is the correct amount of courses for me and what is things that I really need and uh, what is, uh, am I losing something or, although I don't take that course and that kind of thing. So I think they both, although school, a lot of var variety is a good thing, of course. One way to help students is to define better what, what are the basic skills they need for their future. And I, I would like to say here that music students get so much valuable skills in their leisure time. I mean, extracurricular work, which was related to music. So they, they do evenings, they, they do weekends, they do so much those things which are not included in their credits, although they could be, I mean. That, that's a way to ease and their workload that institutions could consider that this group of students are really uh, practicing their uh, subject in their leisure time, but it's not uh, at all taken into consideration <coughs> in the credits. Um, I'm, I'm struck by your, your commitment to the student experience, and I'm sort of thinking again back to you asking alumni because. I'm wondering, do, do students necessarily always know, other than mm. trying it and seeing, exactly. you try it, you were stressed, the next time you do something different? Yes. Um, you know, would students up front know what they need to have all the time? Yes, and um, that could be something which I could have even asked uh, now when coming back to the students, that uh, how are you feeling now? Uh, when they mention something in the questionnaire, uh, when you look backwards, how are you feeling now? But uh, that, that would have been a topic for another research. <laughs> um, and I suppose my final question on the sort of student experience is, um, you know, to what extent does focusing solely on students' needs, um, you know, without triangulating to teachers, end up fueling the very neoliberal values that position students as consumers and teachers as mm -hmm. service providers? Yes, uh, that, that's an interesting question, and there is the danger that uh, we start to treat students as consumers. Although we are criticized, I, I was criticizing that that in my dissertation. But is it so? I think uh, when we concentrate on students, uh, only on the students, uh, we we give space those people who cannot take that space because of their position in the power relations. I mean, s somebody must uh, be a way for them that they can express what is going on uh, so that they, they don't need to be afraid of, uh, of affecting something with, uh, with their future careers or that kind of thing. So there are these kind of power relations in the institutions they are visible and, and they are non-visible, but they are really, really, uh, students are really aware of them and, uh, and they, are, they are aware aware, and they want to be careful to not, uh, not making any harm for their studies or for their future careers. So concentrating on only on the students has been me a way to give space to their voices. Of course, this was a difficult thing in my research because most of the students also tell about their health issues and that kind of things. And when, when there are that kind of things uh, in the data, you must be really careful. So you, the participant should not be identified in any way. So that, that was the thing why I had to let out the instruments so, so in that way, my results are quite in the general level. I cannot point to the specific study program in the quality in data that, by the way, your student is saying this way. And this, this is a limitation, but it's an important limitation so that the students uh, could have rely on that, that this is a safe, way for them now to express their they deep, deep emotions and feelings about 
how they are doing and experiencing the workload. So I don't think that, although it looks like they are like customers <laughs> now in my dissertation, I think yeah, it's, it's not so. Um, well, thank you. So I have one final question. Um, you've, you've talked about further research that could take place, but what are your plans for future research? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I have so many topics in my mind and <laughs> would be so interested in to continue, especially with the Bayesian approach. I would love to utilize it also in the future research. It was a big job to <laughs> study and learn learn those those statistical methods and and who knows <laughs> <laughs> maybe you were just wanting a holiday <laughs> yes <laughs> so well thank you i'll now bring this part of the discussion to an end So from both the doctoral dissertation and in what we have heard today, I would like to say that Tula shows an in-depth understanding of research techniques and methodological issues. Her approach to research design has been extremely systematic and in presenting findings and conclusions, she has shown a capacity to explore thoroughly the implications of the outcomes. The recommendations for future practice and research are also promising for both students and teachers in order to make higher education more effective and meet the needs of a new generation of musicians. So on the basis of my examination of the dissertation, related articles and the discussion heard today, I propose that the doctoral dissertation is accepted in fulfillment of the requirements for the degree of Doctor of Music. Thank you. After this, uh, I recommend that those esteemed persons present who might have critical comments on doctoral dissertation, ask the chair for the floor. Do we have any questions online? There are no questions in live chat, uh, only very positive comments and encouragement to Tula. Thank you. There is one question here, please. There is no question online. Uh, okay. Tuula Jänskäinen, Jami Kärki. Um, I was thinking uh, maybe my questions are more soci sociological ones, but um, was there, uh, you, you made uh, research in UK and Finland, and uh, maybe th this was, these questions and topics was not on focus in your research, but did you, did, did you, took any closer look for cultural uh, exp uh, differences uh, between these practices or support systems. And uh, the second one also maybe sociological one is for language, uh, I mean semantic of language. Uh, is it, was it difficult or was there any issues to to understand these narratives of uh, uh, British students when they told uh, uh, of these experiences, and the third one mm -hmm. is there. Um, if you take a look uh, path forward, was there any research? Um, if you made research. Uh, more cross-cultural research in this field. Was there something to get, um, for example, better, underst uh, better understanding of these practices in different cultures 
and understand better these issues and maybe to get better um, practices in, in these fields. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh, very good questions. And um, the first question especially is something that is so good that you asked. Uh, when uh, I chose uh, two counties, Finland and the United Kingdom, uh, I didn't want to compare those counties and I didn't want to compare the students. Uh, although in, uh, in statistical analysis, uh, I, I compared the university culture of these countries in a way that uh, how the university culture with high tuition fees can affect uh, students' experience, workload and stress when their livelihoods like working alongside studying, funding and uh, amount of hours of working when they are combined. But uh, any other way I didn't compare the countries and that is something that could be done if the countries uh, or the higher music education systems in the countries are willing to do that. Um, in those countries uh, where they have this kind of a tuition fee systems where the students pay really high tuition fees, for example, 20,000 pounds or euros per year, the universities are like companies, so they are really dependent on those those students who pay the tuition fees and they are not necessarily willing uh, to show that kind of result that okay in our institutions our students are feeling much worse than in the other institutions so there are many things to consider uh, uh, if making research which compares countries or institutions so that that was the thing why I didn't want to approach these two countries by comparing them. And when comparing the countries, I compare more the, uh, the, uh, the systems uh, or, or that kind of things than what the students are experiencing in this institution also. And your second question was about... Uh, Yeah, I mean, you, you said before, for example, workload. Yeah, the understanding. Yeah, the meaning of workload yeah. in Finland, and maybe. Yeah. Yes. Th th that's really good, and uh, my purpose, uh, one purpose of conducting this study also in the United Kingdom was that uh, I wanted to learn my English better. So I, I was a doctoral exchange student in the United Kingdom, as well as I was in Australia. So thank you for those institutions. I have so lovely memories from those experiences. And uh, you are right. Um, it was not easy uh, to, when I was not so advanced as I'm now with English. <laughs> so uh, it was a challenge to understand. Of course, uh, I also collected qualitative data through the open-ended answers in the questionnaire. So it was not only the interviews. But for example, when I was uh, transcribing the, the interviews, so transcribing means that from the records they are written as, as words, I used um, an, uh, a native English speaker who made these transcriptions. I, I could not have done it so, so well. So that, that's something I want to thank our university who, in our doctoral community, who provided funding for this. So thank you, very good questions. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Any further questions, either online or on-site? Uh, yes, uh, Artis I'm a doctoral candidate here. Uh, this might be a personal, too personal question, so you don't have to answer that, but I would like to know how did you experience the workload and stress doing the research, and how did you cope with that? So no answer is good, but I think that would be nice information for us. Thank you. Yes, uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, I must say that I had a couple of sentences of my workload as a doctoral student in my lecture, but I had to shorten it because it was 
third, thirty minutes, so I had to take it out to be able to present it in twenty minutes. But yes, <sighs> well, working full time and making doctoral studies, beside that, it has been a huge workload. And as uh, opponent mentioned, uh, there was uh, also extra articles included. So it it was not only this dissertation; it was a music student workload project. So. So uh, I was so interested in the topic that I even made some extra extra articles. And that was also because I wanted really to use the data which students had provided as much as possible. But there has been challenging times, I must admit. And we have had supervision meetings when I, uh, I'm at hospital, <laughs> but not uh, because of, of mental workload, but when bones are broken and something like that. So, <laughs> yes, indeed. But uh, at the same time, I must say that this has been such a lovely journey. Um, thank you, our doctoral community. You know, you are there, my best friends. So I, I, get, I got so good friends from my colleagues and, and I'm sure our friendship continues still. So as much as this has been a huge workload, it has been an amazing journey. So I'm really happy to be today here. I survived. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> All right, some more questions? So we have a question online. Hello. Yes, here. Yes, I, I would like to read one. Uh, Jane Ginsburg from Royal Northern College. Uh, uh, she's writing a fascinating discussion. Well done, Miranda, for your <laughs> insightful <laughs> questions and enable Tula to reflect on her research so effectively. Double well done, both. <laughs> thank you, Jane, and thank you so much for everything. Professor Jane Ginsburg uh, has been supporting my research a lot. Uh, she invited me as a doctoral student to, to the United Kingdom and actually made possible that, that this dissertation has now been done in two countries. So I'm, I'm really grateful. examination has ended. Thank you, dear audience. And please, uh, in the first floor, in front of this this hall, there will be some sparkling wine. So welcome.
Monday, and I work Monday, but I'll 